All right. Welcome back to another episode of Powered by Instinct. I'm Eric Carrera, our VP of Sales. And today, my special guest is Samir Wakle. Samir is the CEO and founder of 1111 Partners. And you've been certified for what, about two and a half years? Is that right, Samir? Yeah. Yeah, about two years. Yeah. And so as we go through, we've had this conversation offline before. And so I know some of the amazing things that Samir is going to talk about. But those of you that have had some challenges finding amazing executives or have tried to hire somebody in the past, let's call it three or four years, you're going to be wowed by his process and some of the things that, that he's going to walk you through. So I definitely appreciate you sharing all of your guidance and wisdom with us. My pleasure. You know, and, and since this is a Colby podcast, we, of course, we have to let, let everybody know what our MOs are. So again, I'm Eric. Those of you that listened before, I'm a 5392. And then Samir, you're a 6582, right? That is right. And so you've been certified for, I think we said, you know, two and a half years, roughly. How did you uh, first hear about Colby or how'd you come across us? Yeah, that's a great question. So we set up the firm about three years ago. And as, as we started looking at how we were going to make ourselves different, I met Lori Lovins from Innovation Savvy, who's also been a certified consultant for many years. And as she talked about Colby and how the, the Colby A and C works together, we got really interested and eventually that just got deeper and deeper. And it was, it finally got to the point that we started thinking we should get certified because this will, this will be very helpful to our clients. So it's been so a fun obviously, experience. yeah, you got introduced through Lori, who's a fantastic certified consultant. She has been certified for a while. When she had you take your A, what were some of your biggest takeaways or what stood out? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, Eric, since you and I are both pretty strong initiating quick starts, that was the first thing that obviously came out was, oh, this makes sense. You know, my tendency that when a problem comes up, my natural tendency is to go like, I wonder if there's a new way to do this. I don't think like, huh, let me go look at the process. Has someone else done it? Immediately, my mind goes to, I wonder what else is going on. So that helped make a, a little bit of sense there. And then my 6.5 was kind of a similar thing where I looked and went, okay, this makes sense of how I've gone through my career and the role I've played. So it was it felt really right on. Yeah, absolutely. You know that. You know, you're a, you're a six. I'm a five in backbinder. I always describe that that as you know, we only need enough information to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, I think there's several people on my team will tell you it's it's not enough information to be dangerous. But we've all done our Colby, so we understand a little bit of that a little better now. Yeah, and that's that's really the key, right? Is it's not that yours is better than mine or vice versa. It's, what strengths do we have and how do we lean on each other? Because at the end of the day, we're not going to get it done by ourselves. We need other people around us. And so figuring out what are the strengths or the superpowers that other have, that's that's the magic. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the, I've always said that my wife and I, for example, so it's not just work, are complementary. And we took the Colby and that's exactly what it looked like. And it makes sense, right? Which is we balance each other so well in the household because we both know where to apply our particular superpowers. And the other makes more sense to, to me as well. Do you remember your wife's MO? Not off the top of my head. I just remember thinking that like, if we were in bizarro world, Renee and I are the same person, right? She's, it's almost exactly a mirror. Higher impl implementer, higher in fact finder follow through, like a, a two and quick start. <laughs> so this is totally just my observations. But what I found is, it's it, with couples, it's either very similar MOs or wildly different. Again, that's just my observation from people I've talked to. And so my wife and I are actually very similar, which is good because when we go on vacation together, we don't have much of a plan. It's, I don't know, we're going to go to this place and then we'll figure out the rest once we get there. Yeah, so that's wonderful. That's all right. So as we start to kind of move forward, right, we want to think about, all right, how do we use Colby inside of our businesses? I know you have a pretty cool background kind of prior to creating 11.11. So do you mind walking us through that? Yeah, I actually think I had a pretty unimaginative career, truthfully. When I grew up, I kind of heard these words of like, work hard, do well, be liked, and you'll, you'll have a perfect world, right? That'll, you will have a perfect life. And so there was an undergrad accounting, consulting, business school, and then I went in restaurants and retail, which I love, for about... 18 years before I started 1111 Partners. And I really specialized on working with high growth companies. So the ones that were just about to hockey stick and had either been acquired by private equity or had raised funds. Those are the types of companies I ended up leading. 
Yeah. And that definitely makes sense how you got into the hiring and recruiting business, because in order to hockey stick, you have to add a bunch of people. Yes, you can you know, eke out some additional efficiencies by making better processes and those sorts of things. But if you're going to open a new restaurant, you probably need 50, 70, 100 new people. And so getting really effective at bringing on the right ones is is criti critical to success. Yeah, it really is. And I wish I knew about Colby back then. Because the other thing is, as these companies start to hockey stick, where you see a lot of issues is with the leadership team. You know, for example, founder doesn't want to let go. There's not the right talent on the leadership team. Those people don't work well together under stress. And if that's not managed well, you start to see companies fail. And so what I started to realize was part of my superpower was the ability to build high performance teams. And that was really, that was kind of the core reason why 1111 came into play or ended up being created was me doing the work part of, and Colby was very much a part of that and going, oh, this is what I'm actually really good at. Yeah. And, you know, we find, you know, because obviously we work with tens of thousands of teams. Oftentimes what happens with the leaders, it's unintentional, but you're sitting in an interview room and you go, hey, Samir, tell me about a time when you were faced with X challenge. And if you would solve it the same way I would solve it, you're amazing. I have to have you. You're going to be a valuable member of the team. And so you end up with a bunch of little mini U's, which is right. not actually what you want when you're trying to, to grow and develop that team. Yeah, that's exactly it, because not all problems are the same. And, and that diversity of thoughts is what really creates a high performance team. Yeah, one of like, here's like a great e example of how this played out was I used to love to go to my CFO and I always, not surprisingly, had great ideas for what we should do next. And she always used to be like, well, if we do that, what would we do about this? And what would we do about this? And I, I always used to think, I'm like, God, my CFO is the most cynical person I've ever met. And what's really true is that she is far more, you know, she's probably like a three in quick start, which is actually perfect when you think about what I should have as a CFO, given who I am, right? And it's when I start to really learn that, that realize that our relationship changed. So for example, my questions to her changed to, instead of like, what do you think about this? It changed to, I'm thinking about doing this. What are the risks you think we're going to find? How do you think we can solve those risks? And so our dynamic and the energetic around our conversations change, and we became much more effective that way. Yeah, well, I mean, once you learn, it's not that she's not being a team player. It's not that she's not on board. It's more she's actually protecting you from yourself, right? And that's her role is to see the potential downside because every opportunity has opportunities and there's some potential upside. But there's also some potential downside and you have to figure out what's that right sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. Having someone that's watching your six is incredibly critical. And I just didn't appreciate that because I was so focused to your point about like, I want to do things a specific way. So the good news is you're not alone in that, right? Most founders, most CEOs are in that same boat. Let's grow. Let's get bigger. Let's make it happen. And then they hear their team members saying, well, wait a minute. What about? And they're like, ah, these guys aren't on board with what I'm trying to do. So yeah, yeah exactly. That, all right. So obviously, as you were going through and you were, you know, growing your businesses and you were helping bring folks on board. I'm going to guess that not every hire went well, right? That is a safe statement, Eric. Very safe. <laughs> I think everybody that's ever hired has made a hiring mistake. Is there one that maybe stands out the most of, wow, I really messed this one up? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Yeah, I actually internally promoted someone a little early. And I think this is a classic mistake. In restaurants, we talk about the fact that that sometimes you would promote the person that's fastest at their job to manager because they were the fastest, right? They were the most productive in the restaurant. And that's actually not the skills you need for management, right? It's an entirely different skill set. And I did a version of that at the kind of staff leadership level, which is there was just a, a person that was very high performer. She knew her region well. She did a great job with it. And the strategic part of the job was just not her forte. That's not good or bad. It just wasn't her forte. And elevating her into a position where that became a larger part of her job just ended up to be a challenge for both of us. Yeah, absolutely. And right, the good news is, right, we, we're all going to make mistakes. And as long as we learn from them, right, that's really the key. So I know you've integrated some of those things that you've learned into your, your search process. Again, we've had this conversation before, so I know, but 
I love to you for you to walk everyone through your unique process because it is really cool. Yeah, sure. And so part of the reason the firm was founded was what we say we try to find people at the intersection of their skill set and passion. And what happens to many people, myself included, as I was just talking about, is we take jobs where we perform well. And we perform well. And so what happens is we get a lot of external validation. People are like, Eric, you are so good at this. And you are 21, right? And you're like, I am? Okay, good. I'll keep doing it. I'm getting promoted. I'm getting more money, et cetera. And all of a sudden you start realizing, wait a minute, I am struggling to get up on Monday morning. And many of us just accept that that's part and parcel of the, of, of the game. And we're out to challenge that. I mean, I remember like we'd be with our community on Sunday mornings and people would be like, it's Sunday. And the question is, why does Monday have to be a bad day? That's not, that's, that's, I mean, there are five days a week we are going, at least that many of us are going to work. We really don't want to be that way. So this idea of looking at both skill set and passion underpins our entire search process. And so that's kind of like, that gives you the macro view. Because our belief is, if you can put someone at this point where energetically they are doing their work the way they want to, about something they're passionate about, then the probability that the organization will thrive is much higher. The people that work with them will feel better. The guests, customers, et cetera, will feel better on and on and on. And so that is how, that's where our process focuses. And what it starts with actually is we take a lot of time up front to really understand our clients. So one of the first things we do with our clients is we send everyone on the leadership team a cold VA because we want to understand what is going on and how do they play together and what are some potential gaps and some other things. And then we talk to the leadership team. We fly down to wherever they are. We'll spend about two days with them. We have bespoke interviews based on what we got from the Colby and, and other information that we request from them. And having this kind of customized, tailored approach allows us to go back to the leader and go, you told us this was the gap. Here's how, as we take a 360 view of it, this is what we're really seeing. Does this feel true? Would this make your team a higher performing team? And often they're amazed. And the Colby's is the Colby and the team reports are a key part of that because we can talk about like, hey, is you know, to your point, have you just created a bunch of mini me's? And it's part of the challenges you're facing because of that. And that leads to some really dynamic discussions. We then do the exact same thing with all of the candidates we put through, including using the Colby all the way through. And so again, Using that with the rest of our process allows us to really create a sense of fit. And at the same time, we've blended dynamite into our approach, along with some other things, to really kind of create interviews for candidates that are just deeper and just designed to get to know you. I've done probably 25 interviews in the past week and a half. It's been a little busy. And I will tell you, honestly, 20 of the executives I've talked to have said, I feel like I was, some version of, I feel like I was truly seen. And if I don't get this job, it'll be because I trust that this wasn't the right job for me. And that's gratifying. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the process you just walked everyone through, it sounds like a lot of work and it is. But we get this question all the time at Colby. Hey, what is the ideal CFO, salesperson, ops manager, whatever it is? Why don't you guys have an off the shelf model? And you basically just walked people through why that doesn't work. What works in ABC company doesn't work in XYZ company. They may be different at different stages of growth. They may have different players on the team. They may be different industry, whatever it is, all of those come together. And while we want the silver bullet, that would make our lives easier. There isn't a silver bullet. You have to take all of these pieces together to really find that right person to bring into your organization. Right. I mean, because you are investing a lot in this individual. I mean, this is a person that's going to be a leader and on your team. And to your point, we were talking about like you want someone who can be in check your six, right? And it is worth it to take the time, we believe, to get a person that's going to be with you for years and years and grow with you. And part of the reason we do this is we do executive search and we do leadership team development. And so one of the things I noticed when I was in the business is that the talent market is siloed. If I need people, I go to a search firm. If a person on my team is struggling or we're struggling, I go to a coach. If a person's not working, I go to an outplacement firm. On and on and on. I rely on my HR department to do onboarding. 
And the result of that is, as the owner, founder, leader of an organization, it is really hard and takes a long time to find someone who actually really understands my team and my business. And our approach is designed to say, like, listen, we're going to be your partner. And so that way, your interests and our interests are exactly aligned. If search isn't the right thing for you, we're not going to recommend search. We're going to say, let's work with the person that's on your team right now. Let's use some tools that will help make that happen. And I think that relationship building is what helps change kind of the nature of the conversation. Yeah. And, you know, for those of you out there listening that are, you know, that have your own business or are independent consultants, those kinds of things, think about what Samir just said, right? He did a bunch of work at the front end to really understand the business and understand the people that are inside of it. And so now he's going beyond just, hey, we need a COO, we need a CFO. He's now then adding that on to, all right, let's help them grow together as a team. Let's develop each member of the team. So again, the upfront investment is absolutely worth it because it is so hard to find that that quality person and you don't want to lose them if you bring them on board and don't onboard them correctly or any of the numerous things that could go wrong in that process. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> So obviously, right, you're helping folks hire executives all the time. What are some of the the trends that you've seen recently out there in the hiring recruiting world? Yeah, you know, some of it feels like rabbit redux, right? Which is if I'm old enough to remember 2008 and, and this doesn't feel like anywhere near as bad as, as back then. But we are seeing a push more towards what, what I think many of us call precision hiring, which is a year ago employees were far more scarce, at, at, especially at the places we're talking about. And so firms are willing to go like, yeah, this person is close. Let's go with it and let's see what happens. Now what we are hearing much more is, listen, if we're hiring somebody, this person needs to work out because, because we may not get another bite of the apple. And so they're asking for a higher degree of precision. They're being a little more thoughtful. That works in favor of how we go about doing this truthfully. But that's certainly one trend we're out there. We're seeing out there. I think there's been a lot of talk about AI. I think um, some of that is very true. I think some of it is, I think a lot of it is, is way to be seen. I'd say those are two of the bigger ones. I could list more, but those are two big yeah. trends that we're seeing. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about that precision hiring piece. I always think of it whenever I'm hiring somebody as I'm essentially gambling with the company's money, right? Because if I'm going to hire someone and pay them, 50, 100, whatever I end up paying them, it's going to cost me that much plus a significant amount more if I get it wrong. And so do I want to make a $100,000 decision just by saying, yeah, good enough? No, I don't, right? I want to, I'm never going to be perfect. It's never going to be 100%. But the higher and higher I can stack the odds in my favor, the more, the higher the likelihood I'll be successful and that person will be successful. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you want, right? We want everyone successful. And one of the things that it's, we can never get back is time. So the, the time invested for you, the time invested by the employee, that has a real, real value. And so if you're looking to grow your business, losing that time hurts. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, right, a, a mishire is, uh, is a painful process. What are some of the mistakes that you find that people make in that search process? Well, you mentioned one, which is I want someone who looks like me. Because, and I think there's great reasons to want people that look like you, but that may or may not be the real need of the team. I think sometimes the actual interview process can be a little better than it is at some companies. So one of the things we encourage our clients and we help coach them on is have a plan for how you're going to interview the people coming in. Because what will otherwise happen is the six people that are lined up to talk to this individual will all go about an inch deep in five different categories. And where you are far better off is allowing subject matter experts to go deep where they are, trusting that their teammates will do the same thing in their areas, and you'll get, for the same amount of time, you get a lot more information. So that's, those are some of the top things we encourage our clients to do. We also encourage them to create some kind of standardized system, like a scorecard. So be aligned on what this role is supposed to hire. And that's part of what we really try to triangulate on in the early stages is we want to make sure that what person X is thinking is pretty close to what person Y is thinking when we start to go look for candidates. Otherwise, it becomes very hard to find the person that, that really is going to succeed there, right? And it's hard for that person, even if they get in the door, to really kind of exceed the expectations of, of their leaders. Yeah, because if you have two leaders with wildly different expectations of that role, 
whoever you bring in is going to get those right mix those mixed signals, and now they don't know which directions which direction they're supposed to head in. Yeah, and it's much easier to solve that particular topic before the people start walking in the door and before you start looking than it is once once we started the process. Yeah. So it's somewhat tied to this, but tell me about the importance of aligning your insides and your outsides. Yeah. So that's a little bit, that's funny. I didn't realize you read that. That goes back to kind of how I ended up at 1111 and, and what I was talking about at the very beginning, which is I had all this external validation of the job I was doing and I thought I was doing great, but personally I wasn't happy. And getting my insides aligned meant that I actually look and said, what am I really good at? And can I create a career in a world where the things that I'd love to do, my personal skill set and passion is what I actually give to the world. And it's always a work in progress, but it's a great barometer of me checking myself to figure that out. All right. So you're going to, I'm going to go back a little bit. I think we touched on this a little bit. I know obviously you met with Lori initially, you got introduced to Colby, but what was really the determining factor when you decided to get you and the rest of your team certified in Colby? Well, so we started, we started to use Colby and then we said, we need to integrate this into our process of working with clients. And it's one of those things that as we're talking to Lori and as, as we're watching the ability to really look at our clients and see how effective it was at finding both the strengths of teams and areas where they can strengthen themselves, it became honestly a no-brainer, Eric. It was like, we need to do this with us to make sure that we are eating our own cooking. And then that just evolved to like, listen, we want when the reports come in, all of us want to be able, when we talk to clients, to do it knowledgeably. Because you get the report that says, hey, I got a perfect score. And immediately the CEO's like, hey, I got a perfect score. What does this mean? And we want to make sure that we're reflecting what, what Kathy created many years ago, respectfully and, and accurately. Yeah, perfect. And, and thank you for that, obviously. And so you guys, you mentioned, right, you eat your own cooking. Are there any big ahas that you took away as you started using it internally with your team? Yeah. You know, one of the big things, a little bit of what I talked about with my CFO just happened. We started to get really clear on for the different roles of our organization, what is for us, and you point this out, and I, I want to reemphasize it, it's not the same for everybody, but we got a good idea of, for example, what the sourcer position, what the Colby profile of that sourcer position is, like the people that will really thrive there and enjoy the work. Because that work is, for example, very heavy research. It is a lot of time in front of a screen. It is looking, it is going to a level of detail that drives me absolutely crazy because that is not my strength. And knowing that with the team, has been really fun. And uh, and the team loves looking and going when we add people to look and go, oh, they look just like me. I'm like, okay, great. One data point. We have more to do, but definitely a helpful data point. Yeah. And you know that brings up a, another point as we were talking about earlier. Is that as you're building a high-performing team, oftentimes you want those various strengths, right? Because you need to, this person is really amazing at this thing. This other person is really amazing at this other thing. But as you look at let's call it duplicated roles, right? Everything from, mm -hmm. let's say, summer customer service or IT help desk or sales or being a recruiter. As you grow and scale your business, you may want to have 10, 15, 20, 30 people sitting in that seat. If you can figure out what that secret sauce is where all of those intersections come together, including the right Colby result, then your only limitation is how quickly can I find more people that have that stuff? That's exactly it, right? And that is how we are using it. And it's turned out to be really effective. Well, perfect. So as we've heard, right, you guys are doing some amazing work with your clients. You go really in depth to make sure that whoever is hiring you guys to make that next critical hire, that you're really understanding their business and the team. And then you're creating opportunities for yourself by doing all that front end work to then go back and do some leadership development and team building and those types of things. If folks want to work with you, if they want to learn more about your process, where should they check you out? Yeah, they can go to our website, which is 11-11partners.com. So 11-11partners.com. And they can also look up our LinkedIn page and my LinkedIn profile. And uh, we will be happy to connect with them. Yeah, so just a quick recap. So it's the number one, the number one, dash, the number one, the number one, dot com. Or partners.com. There we go. Or check out Samir's LinkedIn profile. And so... 
on your last name, I'm just going to spell it so everybody knows. So it's W-A-G-L-E. You got it. All right. There we go. Perfect. Anything else before we wrap up that you'd like to add or something that we skipped? I think I'm great. I'm, I'm honored to be on the show and spend more time with you, Eric. And we're just thrilled with how Colby has worked with us. Yeah. And obviously we're thankful that you're helping to spread the Colby word and all of the great work that you guys are doing. So I, the, the, you know, the feeling of admiration is mutual. I appreciate it. So we're going to wrap up for those of you that are listening at home. If you have not taken your Colby A yet, absolutely go to go do so. Go to Colby.com. Click on that purple button up in the upper right-hand corner. If you'd like to work with Samir and his team, right? Again, go to 11-11partners.com or you can go to Colby.com and find a certified consultant in your area. Thanks and see you next time on Powered by Instinct. Thanks for checking out this episode of Powered by Instinct. This show is brought to you by Colby Corp, a company that helps leaders and organizations thrive using the only instinctive strengths assessment on the market. If you enjoyed this episode, then follow Powered by Instinct wherever you get your favorite podcasts or join us online at kobe.com slash podcast for all the latest episodes.